Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar addressing transplantation of HCV-positive organs into HCV-negative recipients. We're excited that all of you could join us, and we have what I'm sure will be a fascinating presentation planned for you today. Um, my name is Corey Bryant, and I'm the Communications Manager for the Alliance. I have the pleasure of being your host this afternoon. Uh, we have a few housekeeping items to go over before we begin today's program. So for those of you who have never joined us before on this webinar platform, uh, the chat feature is located in the bottom left-hand corner. If you have any questions that come up during the webinar, feel free to submit them at any time. And once the presentation is complete, we'll have some time for our presenter to address as many of your questions as time allows. Now we are recording this webinar. So we will not be opening the phone lines. Uh, that means that all questions must be submitted using the chat feature. Registration is currently open for our upcoming Brain Death Declaration webinar entitled Clinical and Ethical Challenges in, Pedia in uh, Pediatric uh, Brain Death. We hope you'll make plans to join us for that on February 20th at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Registration is also open for our upcoming transplant webinar entitled uh, Transplant Outreach to Center Strategies. So be sure to join us for that on February 22nd at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. You can register for all of these webinars and more on our website by going to organdonationalliance.org. Now for today's webinar, we are offering one SEPC credit and uh, one nursing contact hour courtesy of Iowa Donor Network. Everyone who is listening to today's webinar is entitled to claim continuing edu education credits uh, if you're listening in a group, and I know many of you are, uh, please make sure to get the evaluation email from your group lead. It's a very brief online evaluation which will allow you to receive your credit. Also, one note for nursing, you have 14 days to claim your CE, and for SEPCs, you have 30 calendar days. So at this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Marty Sellers. Dr. Sellers is the Associate Medical Director of LifeLink of Georgia and a member of the 2018 Alliance webinar faculty. Uh, Dr. Sellers, we're honored to have you with us. And at this point, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. Corey, good afternoon. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Goldberg, um, who is the Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and is Medical Director of their living donor liver transplant program, and on top of all that, he has emerged as uh, a thought leader on the topic that we're going to hear about today, and I will um, put the pressure on him by saying that I heard him speak on this topic last year, and uh, he did such a very, he did such a nice job that it was, it's our uh, honor that he actually agreed to, um, uh, to present this topic for us today. It's a very, uh, I think, pioneering um, uh, work that he has, he and his colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania have done, and we look very forward to, uh, to the presentation today. So Dr. Goldberg, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much again. Well, thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity to uh, speak today. So, okay. So the title of this talk is Transplantation of Hepatitis C Positive Organs into Hepatitis C Negative Recipients. So I do have disclosures that I have received one-time consulting fees from Merck. We'll be, I'll be discussing off-label use of an FDA-approved drug and a laboratory-derived test. And much of the work that we've been doing has been funded by investigator-initiated grants from Merck. So the learning objectives are to really identify the number of organs that are discarded annually due to hepatitis C infection, discuss the effectiveness of anti-hepatitis C therapy in the post-transplant setting, and summarize the outcomes associated with transplanting hepatitis C positive organs into hepatitis C negative recipients. We're going to go through a lot more, but that's the sort of overall objectives. The outline um, is to review the basics of hepatitis C as serology, hepatitis C testing, in organ donation, because this has been a source of confusion both within the donation and the transplant community. Briefly, the evolution of hepatitis C treatment and why we're now talking about using hepatitis C positive organs for hepatitis C negative recipients, why there's been a change in the pool of hepatitis C positive organs, um, the possibility of doing this in trials versus practice and prophylactic versus preemptive therapy, um, and then sort of the issues of what we've been doing with our thinker trial, prelim data, and sort of what the potential next 
steps are in this practice. So just briefly, so hepatitis C is an RNA virus, um, which is important, um, unlike something like hepatitis B, which is a DNA virus, because of its ability to actually be cleared and cured from the body. As we're aware, it's passed by blood-to-blood -blood products. Most of the time when people have an acute hepatitis C infection, they have no symptoms, which is why that Gilead commercial um, talks about baby boomers getting tested because most of the time people are asymptomatic. Rarely they can have a severe presentation um, of flu-like illness, but in, in essence doesn't really cause acute liver failure like other infections, and there's maybe been a few cases ever reported. It's thought of as more of like a chronic infection that over 10, 20, 30 years can lead to liver scarring and liver failure. Unlike many viruses and many viruses that we routinely tr transmit through transplant, hepatitis C is curable. There have been long-term follow-up studies of people who've been treated and had negative viral loads for almost 20 years. So it's thought to be curative, unlike things like CMV and EBV, which are incurable viruses. We can treat them and suppress them, but we cannot cure them. I saw, uh, Marty, a message. Someone says the online audio is not connecting. Um, are others able to hear? Yeah, we'll, we'll take care of that. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Okay. Sorry. So something that's important when understanding if someone has hepatitis C is that when you, if you were to infect 100 people with hepatitis C, two-thirds of them would become chronically infected, meaning they have the infection, they have the virus, whereas a third of them spontaneously clear the infection. Their immune system can fight off the infection and clear it, which is very important when it comes to understanding the donors that we see and who is really hepatitis C positive. There's thought to be no reservoirs of hepatitis C such that if someone spontaneously clears hepatitis C, they're no longer thought to be infected. About one to one half percent of the U.S. population is infected, one in 30 baby boomers and three to five million Americans. So how hepatitis C is treated, this is just one slide, before 2011, we had to use interferon. Cure rates weren't that good. Medications had terrible side effects, a lot of interactions. Patients hated it. 2011, 2013, things got a little bit better, but really things have changed since 2014 where we have many different regimens that can cure more than 95% of people um, with you know, anywhere from two to four months of therapy. And we define cure as you treat someone they have a uh, response, and then 12 weeks after stopping therapy, they're still negative. Um, what's important is that cure rates seem to be the same before and after transplant. Some of the issues that become are sort of may other medical comorbidities, renal dysfunction, and, of course, um, the cost. So very important to understanding hepatitis C serologies. I I've gone through this at my own transplant center many times. So if someone has a positive hepatitis C antibody, that is meant to signify that they've previously been exposed and infected with the virus. A nucleic acid test is meant to signify active virus in the blood. So if someone is antibody negative and NAT negative, that's thought that they've either never been exposed or infected or they're in the window period. Antibody positive, NAT negative, is the one that causes a lot of confusion, um, but important to understand. So the, if someone has antibody positive, NAT negative, they could be a false positive antibody. They can have an active infection with low-level virus, either acute or chronic, where it's below the lower limit of detection, but it's still there. It could be that someone is on treatment with viral suppression. It's someone that has a prior infection with spontaneous clearance, and that could be up to a third of people that are infected with hepatitis C, or it's prior infection with treatment. So they've been infected, they've gotten treatment, and they've been cured. The latter two are thought to pose no risk of transmission aside from the window period infections. And I know there's been reports, there was a paper from the group of Cincinnati and reports to DTAC of people developing hepatitis C. The thought is that this is not sort of reactivation hepatitis C, but it's either a window period or some very low level that we just couldn't detect. This is different from hep B core antibody, which with respect to the liver, 
that means that there still is a few viral particles living there because hepatitis B is a DNA virus. This is important because for all intents and purposes, antibody positive, NAT negative, with the exception of window period, is not signify hepatitis C is active, hep C infection. And a NAT positive is, a NAT, is an active infection. So everyone on this call probably is more familiar with this than me, and I'd like to thank um, Rick Haas for giving me these data, but the slide, but so June of 2004 is when the high-risk criteria were defined. NAT testing was variable until February of 2014. February 2014, it was mandatory NAT testing of all donors, but it wasn't mandated to be reported and changed in UNET until August of 2015. So when centers list patients, there's now the question of, is this patient willing to accept antibody positive, and are they willing to accept NAT positive? And I could tell you, many, many transplants centers still don't understand or recognize or the surgeons or the hepatologist or whoever that these are two different questions that signify two different things. And then in January of 2017, there was a consensus conference that talked about using new definitions because historically hep C positive was just based on the antibody. So in terms of utilization of these organs, Part of the challenge has been that the hep C positive has been a misleading term, and there was a paper published um, in mid-2017 that um, organs from antibody-positive, NAT-negative donors in kidney, lung, and heart were treated and being utilized as the same as NAT-positive, which they really shouldn't be, and I think there's been a recognition of this difference between antibody positivity only and NAT positivity that there's been a change. For hep C viremic donors, so the NAT is positive, as you know, the utilization is as good for hep C negative in terms of liver. Kidney, two thirds that we know of are discarded due to concerns about quality and the small number of patients listed for these organs. And lungs and hearts until recently were near universally discarded um, for concerns in recipients with hepatitis C, but also risks of giving someone hepatitis C who had one of these transplants. The cure, like I mentioned, as bad as the cure rates were um, with interferon in people pre-transplant, they were even worse post-transplant, and they were almost thought to be contraindicated in kidney, lung, and heart recipients because of the risk of rejection. These are data that we're all unfortunately familiar with, and I think the numbers in 2016 were a tiny bit higher, but there's been a rapid number of deaths from opioids, as we're aware of, and this has made a major impact in the organ donation community with a 15-fold increase in the number of organ donors dying of an opi a, a drug overdose between 2001 and 2016. This is translated because of the high hep C positivity to a lot of organs being discarded. And when I use hep C positive, just for consistency's sake, focus solely on the antibody, but in 2016, there were almost there were more than 1,300 lungs that were discarded from hep C positive donors, 800 kidneys, more than 600 hearts, and about 150 livers. This is showing specifically in kidney the sort of ch differences in utilization where the majority of kidneys from donors with hep C are thrown out every year. Now, one of the things that is sort of interesting and is a sort of interesting epidemiological sort of finding, which is not fully explained is that just because there's an area of opioid overdoses, the hep C seroprevalence is very different. So I apologize that I highlighted these two regions. I was showing this slide in, in region seven, but in the Northeast, the Mid-Atlantic and the Ohio Valley, about 25 to 30% of drug overdose donors have a detectable hep C antibody, but it's much less in the Southwest and Northwest part of the country. So the pre prevalence of hep C positive donors really is a geographic phenomenon. And this just shows the number of actual donors in 2015 and 2016 across the U.S. And you see the red, um, sadly where I am, has the highest number of donors who are hep C positive, but there's obviously large numbers still in other parts of the country. Now, we're underestimating the supply of potential donors because when people like myself are estimating these numbers, we're relying on the UNIS database, which defines a donor as someone whose organs are recovered with the intent to transplant. So obviously the family doesn't authorize donation, they're not included. If it's a, if it's a DCDD donor, 
and none of the organs are even considered for transplant, they don't get counted, which is very common. I've, you know, it seems rare that DCDD livers are utilized, and if all centers say no to a kidney, it doesn't get counted in any of these estimates. Single organ donors and donors that are never referred for donation, potentially because hospitals think their organs may not be utilized. And these were data that were shared from OPO colleagues in the Midwest, where over a four-year period, they had 90 potential hep positive donors that in their OPO. 44 of them became a donor, so 88 potential kidneys, of which 51 were discarded. But there were 45 donors, which by their estimates were donors with at least one organ that could have been transplanted. But because no organ was recovered by UNOS and the way we collect data was not considered a donor. So all of those numbers I showed previously are likely an underestimate of the real potential. Now, why are hep C kidneys really, which has sort of been a focus of mine, discarded so frequently? So there's a small number of people with hepatitis C on the waiting list. It's estimated that 5% of patients on dialysis have hepatitis C and only 1.8% of patients on the kidney wait list opt in for these kidneys. This is partly because there's probably under um, sort of referral of patients with hepatitis C and our, our group has been looking at data of waitlisting people on dialysis and we found that people with hepatitis C are waitlisted less. But there also is concerns of people with hepatitis C actually don't want organs from other donors with hepatitis C. We've had patients at our center who say, I don't want an organ from one of these donors. And part of the concern is that these donors are PHS increased risk, so they're concerned about other risks, or they'll say, those people have, you know, I didn't know how I got my infection. These donors may have similar risk factors, and I don't want that. But the other problem is the challenge of the thought of being lower quality. Um, and the KDPI, and I guess this, sorry, will not show up on um, this graphics, but the KDPI, which we all know is a sort of measure of um, kidney quality, is at best a sort of only moderate predictor of graft failure, but there's a big bump for having hepatitis C, and it's either the antibody or the NAT. And the slide initially showed an animation, but it was a 33-year-old donor with a creatinine of like 0.8, which would have a KDPI of 41 in the setting of hepatitis C, but if you get rid of the hepatitis C, and if you argue that that's not necessarily a big issue, the KDPI becomes 17. But there's this automatic bump that may make people think the organs are of lower quality. And the challenge is we actually don't really have a good handle as to how hepatitis C affects kidney graft outcomes, because until recently, essentially all of these organs were used in recipients with hepatitis C. So you couldn't parse out where graft outcomes worse because the donors had hepatitis C or because you were transplanting people with chronic hepatitis C and chronic liver disease who would do worse based on that. And we have some data that I'll show at the end that would suggest that really it's not a donor issue and we really need to rethink the quality of these donors. Sorry. So just to put things in perspective, like I said, you know, hepatitis C is a curable infection. It does obviously have a lot of stigma and for many years was this sort of very um, concerning infection, but we routinely transplant viruses um, to patients. Many times they may not even be aware of it. So CMV, which can cause graft loss and increased costs, is almost universally leads to infection without prophylaxis. And 70 to 90 percent of people get infection, 50 to 80 percent without prophylaxis get disease. And the prophylaxis is not cheap either. If you use IV gang cyclovir for 100 days, that costs about $10,000 just for the drug costs, ignoring the costs of nursing and line care. And the valve gang cyclovir is 4,500. But this is kidney data we looked at for 15 years, and 19% of patients are, you know, in essence, given CMV through kidney transplantation. EBV, the percentage that are sort of infected where donor positive, recipient negative is similar, and EBV is associated with a significantly higher risk of post-transplant liver proliferative disorder. So again, when we think about sort of, you know, people becoming infected with hepatitis C, we have to think of what we do in sort of standard practice in transplant. Now, there's not much data to sort of guide us and guide patients about the potential risks of intentional transmission of hepatitis C through transplant. This was sort of the largest published series um, from the University of Wisconsin, where it was 
patients transplanted from 1991 to 1996, it wasn't published until 2012, were they at 118 patients where the donor was hep C positive and the recipient was negative. What was key is that the authors say that these patients who were getting these organs were considered to have a poor life expectancy and to be marginal candidates for transplant. The survival um, and was pretty poor, 10-year survival of 23%, a median survival of five years, but interestingly, half of them died with a functioning graft. The key point, though, of this, that at least gives some of us um, comfort in the setting of giving hepatitis C, is that only four patients developed liver failure or liver complications at a time when there was no treatment for hepatitis C in this setting post-kidney transplant. And the authors even stated that they felt that these poor outcomes were due to poor recipient quality, these are older patients with more medical comorbidities rather than hepatitis C affecting outcomes. So just so where things stand in terms of treating hepatitis C now post-transplant, we know liver transplant um, the cure rates are the same pre versus post-transplant, and this is based on large numbers of patients, and that's why we try our best to not treat patients with hepatitis C who need a liver um, if transplant is their ultimate goal because they get transplanted much faster. Kidney, their data with similar cure rates as well. Lung and heart, we actually have very little data because most senders would not waitlist people with hepatitis C for a lung or heart transplant, partly because of historical worse outcomes, but also because of this is another chronic um, comorbidity. And recently there was an announcement that Duke was starting a trial of transplanting people with lung transplants who pre-existing had hepatitis C. The fact that that is a trial shows sort of the concerns within the thoracic community of hepatitis C. And there are important drug interactions um, for lung with antifungals and heart with amiodarone. So what do we not know or still don't know yet? So will patients know about hepatitis C and understand the risks? Um, which patients should be considered for such organs? Will all patients develop hepatitis C? Will the drugs work as well? What are the risks? But again, we need to weigh these risks against the, 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 the risk of not doing a transplant and other trials that we routinely do. So what is the THINKER trial? And I will thank anyone in advance who is from an OPO that we have bothered you to get a tube of blood to help us genotype. Thank you. Um, we know it's sort of been a, a challenge at times. Um, but the THINKER trial is the trial that I've been co-leading with a colleague, Peter Reese, and it's a pilot trial of transplanted kidneys from hepatitis C-positive donors into hepatitis C-negative recipients. And these are some of the key considerations that we thought about. We looked at recipients that were sort of intermediate age with not a lot of waiting time. We did require that they have a genotype 1 donor, and this was something that was sort of became a challenge at times. But the drug we were using, Zepatir, can only be used in certain types of hepatitis C per the FDA label, so we did require genotyping or getting hepatitis C typing of the donor prior to accepting an organ. Now, something that could come up in the context of if, you know, centers are taking these organs and just something to think about is, is the center doing this as part of a trial or are they doing this as standard of care? Now, the AST sponsored a consensus conference um, and it was actually 2016, and there were representatives from, you know, transplant centers, OPOs, HRSA, UNOS, and the consensus from this conference, again, it's not a non-binding consensus, was that these transplants should have formal, formal IRB-approved research protocols that have been vetted for safety and review of the informed consent process. Now, that's just a recommendation, and there's no policy that forbids transplantation of organs from hepatitis C infected donors into hepatitis C negative patients. The challenge becomes how you treat people if you do this because some insurers have said they would only pay for treatment if it's in a research protocol, but this is just a recommendation and in no way binding. So when we're infecting patients with hepatitis C, there's two ways we can consider treating them. We could do prophylactic treatment before infection occurs on call to the OR, or preemptive when infection is first detected. It's unclear what defines infection in a preemptive, when to check it, and do you have to see multiple positive levels to treat someone. 
So the benefits of prophylactic treatment is that you could potentially prevent infection and have the drug at a steady state by the time someone gets the transplant. Potentially could lead to shortened therapy, although this hasn't been studied in this setting, and maybe prevent replication of other tissues. On the flip side, though, you don't actually know if the person has become infected. There's no data on giving it down an NG tube and the real-world applicability of being able to do treatment on call to the OR because it would be unlikely that you'd ever get prior authorization and get the prescription for hepatitis C medication for someone who's yet to have hepatitis C. Preemptive transplant on the treatment on the flip side is that you confirm when infection occurs. Depending on the medication you're using, you can get extra samples for different typing. You can make sure the patient's stable and taking POs. Um, and it's arguably more real world because you would unlikely to ever have the medication pre-infection. There are theoretical risks of severe acute hepatitis C and when to determine the timing and infection. So if someone has a positive hepatitis C on day three, does that mean that's infected or is there some just residual virus that's left over? So we did preemptive infect uh, treatment. We want to confirm that actually all recipients would develop hepatitis C. Um, the answer thus far is yes, they all have developed hepatitis C. We want to be able to confirm the genotype in this resistance, which is important for Zepatir. We want to make sure the patients were taking POs. It was logistically much less complex because you didn't have to have a 24-7 on-call investigational pharmacy research coordinator. And again, the issues with Zepatir. The major challenge with Zepatir, um, and this in the future may become not a non-issue because future regimens um, can be used against all genotypes, even in renal failure, was the need to get extra blood to do pre-allocation genotyping of the donor, which sometimes led us to either have to turn down donors because of the wrong genotype or because of logistical challenges with getting the blood uh, to our, our lab ahead of time. So what is our trial and just some preliminary data? So the aim of our study was to determine the safety and efficacy of transplanting kidneys from hepatitis C positive donors into hepatitis C negative patients, to determine cure rates, safety of treating a hep C, one-year graft survival, and spontaneous clearance. So we targeted patients that had longer than average waiting times because there were potential significant risks. We wanted there to be sort of large benefits. Also, the longer people were on dialysis, the more comorbidities they accrued. Um, and we wanted patients who theoretically could be a liver transplant candidate were they to develop liver failure after getting hepatitis C. So a big thing that I think you know we did in our research, and the question would become what to be done in practice, is the informed consent process. And there was a lot of back and forth within our transplant center about the best way to do this. So we had a very in-depth informed consent process where the research coordinator would first review the list of potential study subjects. If they met criteria, I or my co-PI would then review to make sure we agreed. We would then get permission from their transplant nephrologist. I'm not sure why it got cut off here, but we would then call, myself or my co-PI, call the patient to describe the study. Um, to make sure they understood the risk, the benefits, and all of that. They would then come in for either a one-on-one, -on -one, depending on the day, or a group educational session, and then they'd have to wait at least 24 hours before informed consent could be signed to let them go home and think about it. We would frequently call their local nephrologist. They could talk to their family about it. So we published our initial data of 10 transplants um, about 10 months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. We have more updated data. So to do 20 transplants, we screened the charts of um, 297 patients, of whom 66 were deemed potentially el eligible. About half of them, when we called them up, were interested and wanted to come to an educational session. A couple people were ruled out um, during the screening process due to abnormal liver tests, and two went to the educational session and didn't want to participate. So we then activated 26 patients, of whom 20 were transplanted, and we have data to present today. So why do patients not come into the educational session? So people had concerns about hepatitis C. They many times would say, I don't want another medical problem. Or there were social stigmas about hepatitis C, or they knew someone with hepatitis C. Some people heard research, and they just didn't want to be a part of it. And there were some outside pressures. 
Um, a few outside nephrologists didn't want patients to participate, and a few sort of social support significant others didn't want their loved ones to participate. So these are the, the characteristics. So, you know, due to logistics and whatnot, we did end up using mainly donors from our region, but we did use donors from as far south as Miami and as far west as uh, Michigan. The ages, again, this is sort of your typical age of a hepatitis C positive donor. One of the things that was sort of, I think we had to work through, and I think from the OPO side you guys see this, is that because historically there have been few people to use these organs, many centers sort of want to wait for the perfect organ, the 20-year-old, 30-year-old kidney. And over time we were able to get our team to sort of feel comfortable taking organs from older donors, even a donor that was in their 50s. The mechanism of death was largely drug intoxication, and even those who didn't die of drug intoxication as a mechanism did have a history of active or recent IV drug use. And the KDPIs sort of were variable from as low as 23 to as high as 73, keeping in mind that that 73, you take away the hepatitis C and the KDPI was about 48%. What was interesting is for our study, we checked hepatitis C levels on day three, and that's how we defined when to treat. But for a subset of patients, we were able to bank blood on day one and day two to really see how early were people becoming positive for hepatitis C. So the first of the 20 patients we transplanted, we had day one and or two blood on 12 people. Of seven people who we had day one blood on, five of them had a detectable viral load on day one post-transplant. Two of them were negative on day one and two and didn't become positive on day three. And of the five people that we uh, had only day two blood on, all five of them were positive. So there was clearly a sort of very rapid transmission of hepatitis C um, in these, from these donors to recipients. And one thing that's interesting is that we actually don't even know how hepatitis C is transmitted through kidney transplantation, if it's just some leftover blood or if it's actually in the kidney itself. Not surprisingly, but interestingly, the donor hepatitis C level corresponded with the recipient. So we were able to bank blood on the donors, and some of the donors had very low viral loads, you know, a, a couple thousand, where some had levels that were in the million. And not surprisingly, the higher the viral load in the donor, the higher the viral load in the recipient. Um, what it does raise the question sort of in the future is that there were some recipients who had viral low levels that were very low, from donors who had viral low levels that were low, and might there be ways in the future to sort of prevent hepatitis C transmission? So for our preliminary analyses, we've had 10 patients that have reached the one-year mark, and all 10 have been cured, and an additional 10 more that have reached the six-month mark and been cured. So the first 20 patients all have reached the traditional sort of outcome of hepatitis C cure. So this was getting to that question of the KDPI predicting outcomes. What this shows here is in the blue box is the GFR, so the kidney function of our patients at, at six months post-transplant. And the red is those who had a similar KDPI. So for our patient with a KDPI of 73%, we matched by recipient age, race, cause of kidney disease, and said, well, how, what, on average was the, K, the GFR of someone with a KDPI kidney of 73%. And what you see here, and I don't have the p-values, but that in blue, the, KD, the, kid, the hep C recipients had a better kidney function in six months than someone with a matched KDPI. What we then did in the green is we said, well, let's get rid of the hepatitis C in our thinker patients and say, what would the KDPI have been had the donor not had hepatitis C? And then compare those patients thinker patients to the, their matches, and we found that the, the GFR, the kidney function, was no different. This was then seen at 12 months as well, which suggested that the KDPI bump from hepatitis C was largely recipient-driven and that these kidneys actually do better than you'd expect for their given KDPI. Now, what are the next steps in kidney transplants? So we need to demonstrate safety and efficacy in a larger number of patients to make it standard of care. 
what is that end, I don't know. I think part of it is what's going to make it standard of care from the perspective of the insurers. And I had a recent discussion with a large insurer in our area, and they were saying that at this point they would still consider this from their perspective investigational and would only pay for drug maybe, and it's not even definite, in the context of it being a research study and not sort of regular practice. There are now drugs that could be used in all genotypes, even in the setting of renal failure, which would obviously simplify the process and prevent us from having to discard kidneys, at least for our study, that are not genotype 1 or 4. Then the question is, can we space out therapy? Because in the real world, if you give someone one of these kidneys, then you apply on day 3 or 4 for hepatitis C therapy. It's going to take a couple weeks before insurance approves it. We would hope that it would be fairly expeditious and that there would not be sort of risk to waiting a couple weeks, but we don't actually know. From the expansion of criteria, I think the donor criteria can be expanded, and I think this is something to really think about, and this is obviously going to be what's needed to really maximize utilization of these organs, but at least in our, number, our end of 20, we've shown that the KDPI is not really a great predictor of kidney outcomes in these donors. So, you know, a 55-year-old, a 60-year-old donor with hepatitis C with a perfectly normal creatinine, that probably, for many intents and purposes, is better than a donor who's maybe 50 with hypertension or diabetes. And then from the recipient side is expanding to older patients, people with more, without dialysis time, operationalizing whether you really need to make sure that someone's liver is normal. Um, to give them hepatitis C. So what are the next horizons? So for liver, I think there have been reports of centers doing this. I know at the recent ASTS winter meeting, there was a presentation from the group at Utah where they've been using hepatitis C infected organs for hepatitis C negative patients. The, the number of discards of these livers is very low with the exception of the hepatitis C DCD livers. So I think that's one area, but the question becomes is, not in essence of increasing the use of li these livers, but are we, can we better use them? So instead of giving a hep C liver to someone with a meld of 20 who is hep C positive, are we better off, and as a, as a society, giving that organ to someone without hep C in a meld of 30? For hearts, the risk of coronary vasculopathy, and I didn't get into this, but there was a JAMA paper in 2006 showing increased risk of coronary vasculopathy and graft failure in heart recipients and lung patients. And for those who were at, I guess it was at the AOPO meeting a couple weeks ago, the group at Brigham and Women's presented some very sort of preliminary data, but very exciting data in their heart and lung recipients who they've been doing hepatitis C positive to negative. So what we've done at our own center is um, expanding to hearts. And hearts is, I think, a very good opportunity because you know, until recently, until we started doing this uh, Brigham and one other center, these hearts were almost universally discarded, and many of these donors are young, otherwise healthy donors. Some of the considerations here as we had to our sort of drug therapy is the acute kidney injury is quite common, and we were still doing this study with Merck, and we still are, so that's a consideration. Which patients are appropriate? So for kidney, it's clear that you could say people with a lot of waiting time are the ones that have the greatest risk, so get, get the most, but what about heart patients? There are some potential drug interactions and issues with the inability to swallow, and what are the risks for these patients in terms of vascular inflammation? So our, our heart study, which is ongoing, is called the USHER trial. And for this, similar to the kidney, intermediate age patients with sort of, you know, end-stage heart failure or, or malignant ventricular arrhythmias, who don't have liver disease or are really too sick. This is an ongoing study that we submitted data to the ATC as a sort of late-breaking abstract, but what we found so far in doing several of these transplants are that patient willingness to enroll is much higher, probably because these patients are much sicker and they have a greater sense of sort of their potential sort of mortality than kidney patients patients are much more willing to enroll. We have had some patients say no for similar reasons, but by and large, it's not been the same issue. As I've had to learn as going from kidney transplant to heart transplant, patients develop a lot more complications, 
post-transplant but also pre-transplant that no longer make them eligible to be a transplant candidate. Drug delivery is an issue because patients frequently re remain intubated for more than three days. Drug interactions are very important because amiodarone is contraindicated with anything that can, contains sofosavir, like Harvoni, so that's an issue in terms of drug therapy. Acute kidney injury is, is not uncommon. And what we've seen so far, we don't have the data, is again, like I said, we don't really know how hepatitis C is transmitted. But what we've seen is that the recipients in the hearts, when we use the hearts and the kidneys from the same donor, the heart recipients appear to have a lower viral load for reasons that we don't know. Um, I can't say anything more scientific than that. So in conclusion, transplanting organs from hepatitis C positive donors into hepatitis C negative patients is an important mechanism to save more lives, increase the number of transplants, and improve utilization of a scarce resource. I'd argue that the, the new therapies that we have should change how we rethink hepatitis C in the setting of transplants. And I still think that this is investigational, but the hope is that over time, and what the time is, I think, is a matter of debate that we would think no differently than hepatitis B core antibody positive donors. The informed consent process is critical, and I, you could argue that maybe we need to do more informed consent for other infections like CMV and EBV, but there are sort of different social stigmas that pertain to hepatitis C that people need to be made aware of, and one that we've actually been making patients aware of, but by I, it's just, it's, it occurs in, in Philadelphia, and I assume it's across the country, is that departments of health track all new cases of hepatitis C. So whenever our patients are in the study and they get transplanted and develop hepatitis C, it gets reported by our lab to the Department of Health, and a few patients have been called by the Department of Health. And we notify them of this so they're not taken aback, but that's something that you want to notify patients of. Um, I think the next steps, you know, I think kidneys are great, and I think it's been able to show that we could do hundreds, if not a thousand, more kidney transplants. But, you know, I think the real horizons in terms of the relative benefits are in heart and lungs, given the smaller number of people waitlisted and the high number of these organs that are discarded. We need to define the operational factors, though, for broader utilization. The insurers are obviously going to be a big piece of this. What is the opti optimal patient selection and how to deal with unexpected risks? Because what we do in our sort of small trial, what other centers do, is obviously great in a small set setting, but when you do this on a larger scale, there will be complications that we may not see and we have to be prepared to deal for them. And just acknowledgments of my co-principal investigators, co-investigators, collaborators, which include the team at Gifts of Life, and of course the patients and donor families. And with that, all right. Thank you very much, Dr. Goldberg, for uh, such an insightful presentation. Before I turn it back to Dr. Sellers for questions, um, just as a reminder to everyone, if you do have questions for our presenter, please submit them using the chat feature in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Um, during the Q&A time, I will go ahead and have this poll up. Um, for those of you listening in a group, uh, please complete this poll and let us know how many people were listening in your group. Uh, and at this point, I will turn it back to Dr. Sellers to moderate our question. Great. Thank you, Corey. And, and David, thank you very much for um, a really fascinating presentation on a topic, again, that I think is um, uh, front and center on the, uh, the radar screen in terms of the next, one of the next pioneering things in, in the field of transplantation. Um, just a maybe a question or two to get things started while we're waiting on questions to come in from the audience. Um, you know, one of the things that when I was a fellow, um, I could basically gauge when I got a liver offer, within 24 hours I would be already post-op and the patient would be recovering from the transplant. Now, uh, and I'm sure the OPOs around the country would um, second this, it is frequently 72 hours from when an OPO is notified of a donor and even when offers are made that, you know, there, there's a long interval between then and when the procurement is actually done. And the question that I'm leading to is if we could treat the donor, i.e. just one person, and render them aviremic, uh, that would save the necess necessity to treat 
however many recipients of those organs um, it wind, winds up being. Are the dynamics of the so, therapy and the logistics such that is, is that even a possibility? Right. So that's something, and I'd be curious what others on the phone have to say about this. So we've actually been talking about that and the sort of feasibility of that. So I think there's two things. So one, it depends on the donor's viral load. So on average, someone drops, you know, one to two log in a week, in theory. Now, it may not be perfect that some people drop faster. So if the donor has a viral load of 10 million, you're not going to make them aviremic. Um, so, you know, sort of the lower viral load is possible. The sort of logistical challenges that we were, because we actually wanted to propose this, is that, one, there's issues of drug delivery because none of the drugs, at least per the package insert, can be used in an NG tube and crushed, although you could obviously do that off-label. But the feasibility, because, you know, and people can have it, um, can answer, but unless, you know, the OPO coordinator is going to be taking out the drug with them when they go out there to deliver it, who's going to be the delivering the drug, at least at OPOs that don't have a centralized procurement facility? So I'm not really sure how that would really work. Um, then the question becomes, well, if you give someone a few doses and you lower the viral load a little bit, and then you have to interrupt therapy in the recipient, might you introduce um, um, resistance? And I think the last question becomes is that we don't know because we don't know how it's transmitted is even if you get the viral load to zero, is it still going to prevent transmission because there may be reservoirs? The Toronto group has an ongoing trial. They had published a case report where they pumped a lung and they checked the effluent out until the viral levels in the fluid were very low. I don't think they ever dropped to zero. And the recipient developed hepatitis C, but it took two weeks. I, so I think the pumping and things like that might be more feasible because I'm not sure, and someone please correct me if you disagree, but how are you going to be able to get the drug to the donor, especially if it's in a remote hospital? And I'm not sure how that would logistically work. Sure, yeah, there are no doubt uh, logistical issues that would, uh, I think, you know, if you're just, you know, just in a, maybe in a, um, in a perfect world, would would that be something? And again, who, who's going to pay for it, et cetera? So there are um, a lot of issues. So, but right. thank you for that. Uh, we do have a couple of um, questions. Um, one, I think there'll be uh, fairly. Who, who paid for the trial drug on your think trial? So, so Merck. With this we went to Merck um, and applied for an investigator-initiated grant. So they actually paid for this research support, the testing, and donate. I mean. Doing, gave us the study drug. So we that's why we were able to start treatment on day three, because we had the drug provided to us by Merck. Gotcha. And, and a related question, um, for patients that were in the trial, what proportion had insurance um, that declined coverage um, later, or, or were they all, um, was it all covered, even the, the long-term therapy? So we didn't, by, uh, so it's a good, we actually didn't. So some places have been doing this where they go to insurance first. Because part of our study that we, you know, to, you know, patients were nervous that we said we we're starting treatment on day three, we didn't get to even talking to insurance because we said we are providing this as part of the study. Um, we actually, though, did have a couple insurers that gave us pushback about even paying for the transplant after the fact, even though that's not investigational, but we did not go to the insurances for paying for drugs. Um, a provocative question, and I share this um, question, and I think you might uh, agree with this as well, um, fully, re fully recognizing you're a hepatologist. Do you think that the hepatitis C will be, or I'll just change the question a little bit, should be taken out of the KDPI calculations? So I think, well, I think first off, the hep C antibody, absolutely, because that that's, doesn't really make sense because – Antibody positive, not negative, that should be taken out of it. I would argue that not yet, but I think, you know, we've done this. Hopkins has had a trial that they, you know, or publish or publish in their pilot results. I know MGH has a trial. If continuously we show that the hep C bump is really a recipient versus a donor, then I think we should change it. I don't think we're there yet. I think many of us think that 
it is really recipient driven, but because we can't prove that yet, I don't think it can be taken out. But in the future, if it sh- if it really shows that it's really nothing to do to the donor, then I think it probably should be taken out. Yes, I and to add to that, I'll just um, say I was at the meeting last week where um, the surgeon from the Brigham um, showed their data, and they had two groups, one that was antibody positive and NAT positive, so clearly infectious, um, and the other group was antibody positive, NAT negative, and they were waiting to do the preemptive treatment, as you guys were, and zero of their antibody um, positive, NAT negative patients converted. So I think um, the hepatitis C, uh, unless it, and right now it's still, if you're antibody positive, it impacts the uh, KDPI, KDPI even if you're net negative. Is that correct? Well, it also impacts the utilization. I could tell you it's taken me a long time to convince my surgeons to lift everyone for these organs, but still most places are not doing that. Um, but in theory, I'd argue that every patient, I mean, liver you could argue, but if you're listed for PHS increased risk, you should be listed for antibody positive, not negative, but that's my own bias. Sure, yeah, and I think that's a stigma that is just, it's, it's unfortunate that it's going to take a while to change, but I think the data are clear that it, it could be done safely um, without any regard to the serologies if they're not negative. Um, shifting gears a little bit, how do you take into account the adjustment of transplant meds on patients taking Zepatir, and does this change with um, uh, a detectable uh, viral load? So, yes. Yeah, so one of the other reasons why we've gone to Merck is that Zepatir has no clinically meaningful interaction with tacrolimus. Um, it does with cyclosporin. Some of the other medications have a slightly more, but it didn't actually cause any major issues with the tacrolimus, which is one of the pluses of Zepatir because of the limited interactions. So we didn't have to really adjust the tacrolimus any more than we would in normal practice where you're sort of tweaking it, you know, every so often. Sure. Okay. Um, and do you know out of, and I know Gift of Life, your OPO, does um, pump a fair number of kidneys. Out of the 20 kidneys that were transplanted in your study, how many no, were None of them were pumped, actually. And was that by design mm-hmm. or just... Um, how it had turned out. We, just by it wasn't by just how it happened. We said that we weren't going to specify and whatever happened happened, but none of them ended up being pumped. And they still behave as well. It's not better than the comparator um, the comparable KDPI group. Yep. The other thing, the other thing I think to emphasize that point is those patients were transplanted much much sooner, so they saved uh, you know who knows how many years on dialysis, so their survival even though they even though you showed that the renal function is better, which will predict a better survival, um, it's enhanced by the fact that they were uh, taken off dialysis sooner. Do you know uh, what was the waiting time from being listed to the study to being transplanted? So um, the, the time from activation to transplant, so was uh, the median time was two months. So it was, and that's partly because we had a, you know, say no because of the genotype and all. I think at the Hopkins experience, it was about a month or month and a half. Um, right. And it and actually got they, faster over time because I think fewer people were being listed. Sure. Yeah, good, yeah, good response. Then, and what is the average, just to put it in perspective, what is the average or the median wait time in your OPO for a kidney? Uh, depending on the blood type, five years. Right. So... so Say, I mean, say it's four and a half years plus of dialysis. So, yeah, um, and that's and that's assuming someone survived on dialysis to get the transplant. Precisely, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and with respect to um, live donor recipients, um, are you do you have plans, or are you able to complete the treatment prior to their elective transplant? So this has not come up with live donor tra- uh, transplants. I-, I know there was a paper, there was a, a paper published in AJT, a case report of someone with hepatitis C who they treated the donor, got clearance, and then they used them um, for donation. We've not encountered that experience yet, so I can't answer. Great. And um, a little bit of a 
provocative question. I mean, by definition, you know you're giving patients without hepatitis C, hepatitis C, or you know, all of your patients so far have at least converted. Um, are you required to report this transmission to UNOS and the DTAC? No. So we actually just spoke at. It actually has worked out come on DTAC, but we spoke to UNOS beforehand. It didn't meet criteria because it was an expected known transmission. Right. So all all unexpected transmissions have to be reported, whether it's infectious or malignant or whatever. But was, and someone actually asked this question at the last at the OPO meeting, and that was the that was. The but response. it does. But it does have to get transmitted still to the Department of Health, and a couple of our patients did get a call from the Department of Health. Uh, Dr. Wolf, uh, Cameron Wolf, who's Cameron of DTAC, um, answered this in the same way that if, if, it's, if it's an expected transmission, it's not required to be discussed at the DTAC. Um, and why are you hesitant to list NAT positive livers, or did you say that? So I think there's a couple things. So, you know, some people, I don't argue this, but some people argue, well, those liver, we're not discarding those livers, so we should save them for people with hepatitis C. I don't feel that way, but some people have argued that. I think it's, I think there's no reason to, but it has to be in the right setting. So, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, if you're not doing it in a clinical trial with industry sponsorship, can you guarantee that you can treat the person post-transplant? So I, I personally don't think it's ethical to do the transplant without a guarantee that you get insurance approval. And like I said, you know, our local, one of our local commercial insurers said they would not approve therapy outside of a research protocol. Um, now, there are some health systems that have said they would pay for it if insurance said no. We haven't done livers yet, just to be honest, because um, I felt like the sort of, they're getting utilized the most. And I think those are, many people say, the, the least questionable because we the organs are already infected, that I, the, the sort of the yield of potential increased transplants was much greater in kidney, lung, and heart, which is why we haven't done livers. I think livers would be fine, but again, I think in any fashion, you have to, I think it's sort of unethical to not really guarantee that you can treat them afterwards. Fair, yes. And right now, the utilization of hepatitis C positive livers in the recipients that are already hepatitis C um, means we discard fewer livers than we do other organs because of that. Is that right? Exactly. I think there was a paper that the utilization, the discard rates are lower in hep C viremic livers than they are in hep C negative livers. Is that right? Okay. Um, so go back to the living donor option. Um, can the living donor take the medications if they're on, um, you know, most of these, all these patients have at least chronic renal failure, if not end-stage disease on dialysis. Um, medically, can they take it? And to add to that, um, do you support, would the, with your experience, would you think insurance companies would um, would approve it? So you're saying for living donors? For the living donor kidney situation, um, you know, the, the medication, it used to be that renal failure or renal, you know, end-stage renal disease was a contraindication to uh, some of the medications for hepatitis C. Um, I think that's no longer true with these with the direct acting antivirals. But so well, one, it depends they... actually. So so Zepatir, and so the drug we use Zepatir and the drug Mavaret, which is made by AbbV, both can be used with any degree of renal dysfunction. Um, again, obviously, if you had a living donor who had kidney issues, that might be a separate sort of issue, but the medications can safely be used in the setting of renal um, failure. The, the medications that have cefosfavir, there's, and again, there's emerging data that says it may not be an issue, but it's been con contraindicated in the setting of renal failure. Um, but there are medications, ours and the one by AbbVie, Merck's and the one by AbbVie, that are safely usable in the setting of renal dysfunction. Gotcha. And actually, as Listening to your response, I think I might have misunderstood um, or misarticulated Debbie's question. So, if you have a living donor that was hepatitis C positive, would um, would they be appropriate candidates to be treated and then donate? Um, without opening a Pandora's box, I, if someone other, my own perspective, I would think potentially. Um, 
you know, obviously you'd have to make sure they have no other medical comorbidities. But personally, again, my own opinion, I'd rather, as a, I mean, a liver doctor, but I see, I'd rather have someone who has treated Hep C be a living kidney donor. It's probably better for them than it is for a diabetic or hypertensive sure. patient. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, and in the All right, gentlemen, we have um, reached the top of the hour, so I apologize that um, all the time we have questions for. So thank you all very much for submitting your questions. We really appreciate it. Um, and to thank you very much, Dr. Goldberg, for an incredible presentation and to uh, Dr. Sellers for moderating today. Um, so to all of our participants, we want to thank you so much for your time, and uh, we wish you all a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you very much and take care.